Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I have a couple of things to I wanted to mention before I get started. Um, my goal today is to finish talking about parameters and talk about the Kaiser-Nostig Bogart polynomials a bit. Uh, but before I start, there are a couple of loose ends. So one is uh, I'm, I'm actually a little mad at myself that I didn't do this earlier. Uh, I, I'm I know everybody's. Well, I hope everybody has seen this site. This is on the new group site. There's down at the um, bottom menu item. Okay, can we find a way to turn off the front row of lights? Thanks. <clears throat> uh, so here on the Atlas website, this, this bottom link here uh, is to the documentation site. And uh, this is fairly recent. Uh, my former graduate student, Ron Lee, who's in the audience, was uh, primarily responsible for setting it up. And then a whole bunch of people here have been contributing to it. And um, it's really a, a great resource. There's tons of information there. So I want to uh, encourage people to look at it. So um, for example, uh, if, you, if you're interested in K over with some K mod B, uh, there's a whole section here on it. And uh, for example, if you click here on the moral of the story, uh, there's a fairly detailed explanation of the example I did in my talk about uh, Cayley transforms and different cartons and so on, and uh, the, uh, the split carton in issue 101 and so on. And there's many, many pages with this kind of detail, so I suggest you take a look. Also, as far as the uh, software itself goes, there's quite a bit, so there's uh, there's a whole page here on the Atlas language, and some design principles, basic stuff. Um, where is it? There's a uh, um, um, oh yeah, uh, there's there's this. Um, Temporary because it's tempered, 
and then you deform out, and there's no reducibility. There's no reducibility at the origin. So you deform out, and the first reducibility is at this point, and then you have to do a calculation to see what happens. And uh, in other words, you draw a, a line from zero out to rho, and there's a finite number of reducibility points along that line where you have to do a calculation. And Atlas does this, so I wanted to demonstrate it. That's correct. So the and this the points of intersection are the elements of that surface plot? Points of intersection. Right. I mean these 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 lines are the the lines where the co-roots take integral values. Uh, this is this is the um, this 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 is the G2 graph paper that was provided by John Stembridge. If you're interested in getting it for yourself, uh, go to John Stembridge's website. Um, so what was the question, the points? Well, so the points are those points where all components are integral, so those for G2 that is each other's time. Yes. So all the times go to the second, well, the time. Oh, I see. Um, oh, yeah, yes, I understand, yes. The X over star is that lattice, that's correct. It, it's the, the, the dots. lattice of, the, it's the points that have uh, six lines through them. Right, like this one right here. No. That's a long route. Oh yes, that's right. That's a long route and that's a short route. And in this case the 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 root the uh, X upper star is the same thing as the root lattice. So it's the lattice spanned by this vector and that vector. No. No. And this, oh, sorry, this vector. This is this is a simple short route. <coughs> Um, okay, so uh, I wanted to demonstrate um, what Atlas can do. Uh, my window. So G is the split group uh, G2. be the trivial of G. <clears throat> so here's the uh, trivial parameter x is equal to 9 and lambda nu are both rho and I uh, uh, lambda nu are both rho and uh, what I want to do is I want to deform nu from rho which is at one of these red dots all the way down to zero and there's a command to do that test line did is it started out at nu, that's uh, at rho, which is, this is this is t here, this is a scalar t, and 1, and you're multiplying this by rho. So this point out here is rho, 3 quarters rho, 3 fifths rho, 1 half rho, and so on. And the software computed, this is where, these are the reducibility points <coughs> along that line. And uh, there are more hyperplane crossings than that, but it, the software knows that even though you might think there's some reducibility at that, that those points, there isn't. Because this is exactly the points, set of points where the module becomes reducible, and so those are exactly the points where unitarity can change. So uh, the the values of the simple co the, the coordinates here are the values of the simple co roots on the parameter. So this one fifth point says that the simple co roots take the values one fifth and one fifth. The highest root is two times one co root plus three times the other. And, and so the value of the highest co-root at that point is two-fifths plus three-fifths. Thank you. Okay, and two plus three is five. 
The Nautilus <laughs> will tell us whether it is. I don't remember. But. I thought that maybe it just also said what happens in the intervals between. Well, that's 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 what this does. So you see, yeah. So there there are five reducibility points, but there are, there are ten or eleven, ten or so points here, and so. Uh, what it does is, I don't want to call it. Okay, I think I understood. Um, so what it does is it, it starts at zero, where it knows it's unitary, and then it goes to the point one tenth, which is the middle of this alcove, and it tests that it's unitary. And then one fifth is this line right here, and then it, it, it tests the middle of each alcove and so on. And so there are 10 points that it's testing along here. And you see that it starts with two trues, a false, three trues, and then a whole bunch of falses and then a true. So there's two trues here and here, and then a false, and then three trues being on this line, this red thing, this line, and then a bunch of falses, and then a true out there. And that calculation, uh, No. You see the, the last true. Ah, sorry. Well, no, I mean, the, the unitary set is closed. So if you, have a unit, if you have a unitary region, everything on the boundary is automatically unitary. All right, so, I mean, David calculated this by hand in the 80s. And the software just caught up to him a few years ago. All right. Questions about that? All right. All right. So let's go back to where we were. Um, to just um, say one last thing that came up at the end of David's talk. Um, so David explained how you compute the Hermitian dual of a parameter. Uh, if you have pi, uh, how you compute pi h. And um, it's, a, it's a... And I think I lost a minus sign in what I wrote. Do, is that true? I think so. And anyway, it turns out quite remarkably, that um, if, if you have your G and your inner class uh, delta, which you view as an automorphism of G, uh, and then if pi has real infinitesimal character, then pi upper H, so remember this is an involution on the space of representation. Uh, it takes pi to a different representation. <coughs> well, let me just remind you that, that pi goes to pi h is an involution, and pi is isomorphic to pi h if and only if pi admits an invariant permission form. And a remarkable fact is that pi upper h is just uh, um, pi upper delta, which is to say delta is an automorphism of G, and it induces an automorphism of the representations of any real form of G, and so this automorphism uh, turns out gives the permission dual. And uh, uh, somewhere in David's calculation, once you correct the calculation that David was doing, if it needs to be corrected, this follows immediately. Um, I mean, the proof is what David sketched. Uh, but <laughs> um, this is, in some sense, the one of the important discoveries of the Atlas Project, which is that uh, when we first started playing around with this stuff, um, I, I, I started to, to do some experiments, 
And I discovered that if G is equal rank, corollary, if G is equal rank, every pi, of course, with real and physical character, is permission. Uh, that's because equal rank means delta is equal to 1. <coughs> and we observed this and we sort of couldn't believe it because, and I asked all of the experts, well we started with David, he didn't realize this, and we asked all of the experts, Roger Howe and Nolan Wallach and Wolfram Schmidt, and, and nobody had noticed this. And I mean, once you notice it, it's easy to prove, but nobody had realized it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Nolan Wallach told me that, that at first he thought every representation was Hermitian, and then he discovered a counterexample in SL3, which is not equal rank, and then he just gave up, he didn't know. <laughs> so um, th this is uh, quite, a, quite a elegant little statement. Is yes for all the Pardon me? Is the yes for all Well, no, so when he discovered that the answer isn't yes for all representations, he didn't know what the answer could possibly be. Yeah, yeah. right, then there's no, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Isn't the counterexample in SL3R just the three dimensional uh, tautological representation? Is that what uh, I No, does it? Well, I mean, that, that is a, a representation of real infinitesimal character that's not remission. Help. Oh, so oh, there are two three-dimensional representations, and they're, they're related by delta. Yep, that's correct. They, I guess you know they didn't think about that. I mean, I, I don't, I don't remember what Nolan's example. Was. That's why the notion of a holomorphic representation of SL3R is not well defined. <laughs> yes. What is phi over delta? It's uh, it's it's delta is an automorphism of G, oh. and it, it induces an automorphism on the space of representations. Phi. Yeah. Pardon me? But, but then they don't present your, your info. Well, you can arrange it to. So you, you, can, you can arrange that uh, delta theta is equal to theta delta. And then, then it's okay. Sir, I need, I need to can I ask a question? Sure. I need to answer. So when you do the contract medium, yes. choose one that fixes a thing, how is this? Sorry? The contract medium is also fixed. I mean, there, 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 uh, I'm not sure what the question is. I mean, there is an automorphism in the contragradient. Yes, and how is it related to this? Oh, ah, okay, so um, I, I think this is your question. Uh, there's the notion of uh, on contragradient, which is just the representation on the dual space. And it turns out that um, pi star is isomorphic <coughs> to pi upper C, where C is a Chevrolet is a particular um, automorphism of G. Is that the question? Yes, it is. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so uh, I, I'll just say this briefly because I don't want to get too uh, too far down this road. But um, there, there, there are three natural um, uh, involutions. Um, so you have a representation pi v. There's um, there's pi h on v upper h. There's pi star on v star, and there's pi um, uh, bar on um, v. Or should I call it v bar? Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know a good notation. Yeah, um, there, I'll write pi upper c, where where the, the, um, pi upper c is is the is the conjugate representation. Um, it, for, it, it's, it's basically pi of g upper c is equal to pi of g bar. If you have a representation, you can just take the bar. It, it, for infinite dimensional representations, you have to be a little more careful. But anyway, there are these each and each of these. Is an involution on the space of uh, is an involution on the space of representations, and what's true is that pi upper h um, uh, is isomorphic to
um, uh, pi upper H is isomorphic to pi upper C upper star. And they all commute. So any the, the product of any two of these is the third. So if you want to just just that. The product of any two, product of any two is equal to the third. And so for example, if you're in the equal rank case, um, pi H is always pop. So for example, if delta is equal to one, that says that pi C is always isomorphic to pi star. Now, uh, uh, up to that point, you would... Ah. Yeah. Um, uh, it, uh, it, it moved, this is only a real infinitesimal character. Everything above is, is general. And a real infinitesimal character. Yes? So, in the story of the uh, fragment, the observation is ambitious. Yes. <coughs> yeah, so um, I, I, you, it, it comes out, I, I forget. <laughs> uh, statements in my talk were, were messed up somehow, but you, your question is still valid. Does that mean that there's an obvious vial group element? And the answer is yes. Uh, it's the long element of the vial group of the real roots. Uh, and in the yeah. equal rank case, the vial group of the real roots always has minus one in it. Uh -huh. so, so the long element is acting by minus one on on A, and that's what that's part of what makes everything work. Is that the star the complex one? Yeah, just the complex dual space. Okay, so let's go on. <coughs> Recall from last time, uh, an atlas parameter is a triple x lambda nu. And um, well, let me let me uh, let me hit David off at the pass here. Uh, uh, I, I, I scrambled to get these notes done this morning. I guarantee there are some no misprints. Um, feel free to point them out, but I'll fix them. Uh, an atlas parameter is a triple x lambda nu. Uh, x is an element of the KGD set for G, which is this finite set. Uh, lambda is an element of x over star plus rho, and nu is an x element of x over star tensor with Q. Uh, furthermore, lambda it, it represents a coset in this quotient. Theta x is the evolution defined by x, and nu represents a, co or, in a, a, a coset in this quotient. And as we've discussed, um, you can always replace nu with a representative which is fixed by minus theta, and the software always does that, but it's not necessary for you to do that. Uh, the infinitesimal character of the associated uh, representation is given by this element, uh, which is gamma, and uh, the bottom of order of this element defines an infinitesimal character. We say that P is standard if this condition holds, uh, I forgot to say, this, this is gamma. This is gamma. Um, if, we, if you have this positivity condition for the um, Simple code for the simple for the imaginary roots. And yesterday I wrote strict inequality here, but um, today I'm going to give us a, a slightly better statement, which is you allow weak inequality here. Uh, we say it's final if this parity condition holds, and I'll do an example of this in a minute to illustrate what this is about. And uh, it's non-zero if, if gamma alpha check is allowed to be zero on some imaginary roots. But if it's zero on a compact simple root, that's not allowed. That's the non-zero condition. Okay. And there's a notion of equivalence of these parameters. And uh, it's a little bit technical. Uh, so if you want to look it up, I've posted the equivalence of parameters notes in the reading list portion of the website. The details are there. 
Uh, I'll just give you an idea. Um, one of the parts of equivalence is this, that if you have a parameter x lambda nu, and you have a simple x complex root. So simple roots are fixed once and for all. So simple just means simple. And x complex <laughs> means complex with respect to theta sub x. If you have such a thing, you can act on each of the three coordinates and you still get the same, and you get an equivalent parameter. Okay? And then there's, there's another slightly more complicated uh, condition having to do with, simple, with real roots, but uh, <coughs> I'm not going to state that. And um, here's a little exercise for later. Well, um, well, I'd like to mention this just as a, um, as a practical thing. If you're, if sometimes you want to construct an atlas parameter, and you can't even get started. Like you want to construct a parameter on some carton or with some x or something, and um, some, sometimes it's hard to get it to work. Well, rho rho always works and gives you a, a representation of infinitesimal character rho. And so um, that's that's always a good example to try. And then uh, sometimes what you can do is you can look at the block of that representation, or you can move it around by various kinds of operations. Anyway. But it, it's also mathematically uh, an interesting family of uh, parameters. I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay. All right, so one of the subtle things in the subject is this notion of final, and I want to illustrate what that's about. And it really comes down to SL2. So um, in Atlas terminology, there's this parameter x sub 2. That's KGB element number 2 lambda is equal to rho, and nu is equal to zero. Now, the, the trivial representation uh, is given by nu is equal to one. And, but here I said nu is equal to zero, so this is a representation with singular infinitesimal character. The infinitesimal character is in fact zero. Okay? And, um, uh, sorry, and, and this is a final representation, and the course is final parameter, and the corresponding representation is the spherical principal series of SL2, which is irreducible. On the other hand, if you use the software, and I'll show the software in a minute, um, if you put in this parameter, where you, uh, oops, that's the same, this is a 2. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's, a, that's supposed to be a 2. This is not final, and uh, it, the reason is it's the non-spherical principal series, and that representation is reducible. And if you're trying to parameterize representation, well, it's not only reducible, it's completely reducible. It's, unit, it's, it's tempered, it's unitary, but it has two pieces. And if you're trying to classify the, um, you're always supposed to get a unique irreducible quotient, but this doesn't have a unique irreducible quotient. And um, what happens is that at this, this bad one, uh, it, it's the sum of two limits of discrete series. And so, if you're trying to, if you're thinking about parameters, if you, if you come across this thing, you should, you, uh, you shouldn't keep it, you should throw it away and replace it with the set of two limits of discrete series. So here's what happens in the software, and I'm mentioning this partly because uh, this happens a lot, that the software tells you complains about a parameter, and it's good to know what it's complaining about. So G is SL2, and you take this parameter 210, and it tells you that it's final, and its infinitesimal character is zero, and the highest weight of its lowest k-type is zero. That is to say, this is the spherical principle series. Right? On the other hand, if you take this other parameter where you set this second coordinate to be even, for example, zero, um, it's, it's a perfectly good parameter. It changed lambda to 2. We saw that, but that's okay. Um, but here, right here, it says non-final. And uh, if you ask the lowest k-type, it'll complain and say there's more than one lowest k-type. So you have to do a little bit something slightly more complicated. It has two lowest k-types, which are 1 and minus 1. And this is the lowest k-type of the limit of discrete series, and this is the lowest k-type of the limit of anti-holomorphic series, and this reducibility uh, is why this is a non-final parameter. And 
the definition of final basically says that um, uh, in any group, if you take a real root, you make a little SL2 out of it, and you check this condition in that SL2. Yes? So if I to the Yes? <laughs> yeah, Atlas has a mind of its own. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I've learned not to, uh, as long as it's equivalent mod, whatever, it's fine. So it doesn't vary depending on what it's happening. You always come up with something. When we talk about the value of the picture lambda, yes. Yeah. You put a zero, yeah. and, and I'm changing it to two. Sometimes when you change it, you say it's You know, not, not in this group. There must be some other, other group or something. Because if you put two here, it definitely keeps it at two. That's what Mark's saying. But if you put any even number here, it'll make it two. It, it doesn't matter. It's not so surprising because huh. it's actually stored more or less than the row internally. So internally it knows one. And then we print it, it adds one to one. So that's why it comes out. Okay, so. Uh, as, I, as I said, associated, well, the, this is a slightly more precise statement of what I gave yesterday. Um, if you have a standard final non-zero parameter, so it's those three conditions, associated to it is a standard module denoted I of P, and it's constructed either by real parabolic or homological induction, depending on your mode. Uh, the theorem is, is uh, suppose you have a standard final non-zero parameter, so, I, I hate to say all those words all the time. There, there are some papers which would replace that with an SFNZP or something, but I hate that. Right? You know what I'm talking about? The, just call this an SNFZ parameter or something? Anyway. Um, I, I, let's not get into that. Yeah, but I mean, literature, they're definitely different conditions. Um, oh, I'm sorry, you reminded me. I, I wanted to, um, when I, I was talking about non-final, there are other ways that parameters can break down. So if you put in a parameter, it might say, it might say it's not standard. Uh, it might say it's not normal. There's various other things that are more technical conditions. The most common one that you come across is this non-final one, but there are others. Non-dominant. Non-dominant? You've got a non-dominant. Oh, right, I'm down and it says, yeah. Um, okay, um, suppose you have one of these parameters. Associated to it is a standard module, IP, and that has a unique irreducible quotient denoted J of P, and this map is a bijection between uh, those parameters and the irreducible admissible representations of your real group. So that's our version of the Langlands classification. 